So guess what I finally did? I read part two. If you don't know what I'm talking about, I recently, well, not so recently, one year ago, made a video about book one of a trilogy and this video is up on my channel. If you haven't watched it, you might want to go and watch it now before starting into this video. Otherwise, it's going to be even more confusing than it already is. But of course, that's up to you. Do whatever you want. I am going to talk about book two, The Novice, right now, after over a year. I don't know when this is going to be up, but let's see. I don't know if you're hearing the storm outside. There's a literal storm. I hope you don't hear it. But yeah, I don't know how long this video is going to be because if you've seen my last video, which was about Wicked Lovely by Melissa Marr, that one was one and a half hours long. I'm trying to keep this one shorter, but let's see. Just some quick thoughts before we start into it. I liked the book. I thought it was very different to the first one, but I liked them both. I started to remember a few things about it during, um, well, while I was reading. And I also started to remember some things about book three, which uh, we will see when the third video is going to come, but it will come. But I liked book two. And I can only say, if you want to read it for yourself, do it. You might like this book if you are into magic school, <laughs> if you like kind of a doomy atmosphere, dark secrets, but also very much school life with um, bully classmates. And yeah, if magic school with a bit of a mystery element and fantasy setting are your thing, then you might really want to go and read this book before listening to me talk about it and hearing all the spoilers. Especially if you like a kind of Dark Academia vibe, um, old school building, bully classmates, um, competition for knowledge, secret passageways through the school, um, teachers with dark secrets. Yeah, if that sounds like your thing, you might like this book. So as I said, it it's really a very different feeling, a different vibe, a different style of book than the first one. The first one was more like a um, adventure story, kind of. It was very set in itself. It could have just ended there, except for the big secret, the big cliffhanger that's going to start everything that's happening in book two and three being the black magic part of course oh and i'm always talking about the trilogy because i'm talking about the black magicians trilogy um those are the three books that i read back then and like those are the three books the magician's guild the novice and then the high lord but there are also more books that take place in the same world. Especially um, the trilogy about Zanea that takes place after the events of those books that I'm talking about here. I hope that makes sense. Oh, and by the way, that's a little bit off topic, but I recently also reread uh, a different trilogy by Trudy Canavan that's set in another world, another universe. That's the Age of the Five. I think it's called. Yeah, Age of the Five is the name of the trilogy. And I'm not gonna make a video about those books because I just like them too much. And also they are massive. I think I would be talking five hours. But I really, really like them. I can absolutely recommend. They are a lot more complex, like the world building, the whole story is a lot more complex than... Um, the Black Magicians trilogy. Trudy Canavan builds a whole world with so different people and countries and an interesting theme of religion is in the center. So if you like that, if you like um, magic and gods and, and very high stakes fantasy adventure story, but with very interesting characters, that is not YA. 
the characters are definitely a bit older. They are, I think, the main character when it starts is maybe in her mid to late 20s. So I absolutely loved it. I read through those books in no time and I can absolutely recommend. I'm not gonna make a video, but if that sounds like your thing, just go and read the books. I would say let's start part one, chapter one, the acceptance ceremony. We start with Sonea and Rothan, her mentor or guardian, getting ready for the acceptance ceremony, where Sonea and the other new novices will become part of the guild. We are, I think, five months past the events of the last book. And in the meantime, Sonea had lived in the guild and gotten some more training, some basic education. She can now read and write kind of well enough to become a novice. She learned to control her magic better. And the ceremony is big and pompous. And Sonea at one point thinks about how easy it would be to rob um, those rich people of their jewels. Because remember, she is a thief girl. Um, yeah, but all her new classmates don't really seem too friendly. Um, there's obviously a lot of prejudice against her, the first ever novice coming from the poor part of the city and not of the wealthy, powerful families. And a lot of them seem to share the sentiments of Fergun, you know, from the last book, the villain, um, that poor people should not be allowed to learn magic. So we're up for a good start. The ceremony is mainly just them taking a vow to obey the rules of the guild and some of the novices being accepted by a guardian, like Sonea is by Rothan. And part of this we see from Rothan's POV, um, which remind, reminded me that he actually knows about Acheron, the High Lord, performing black magic. Remember, it was this whole deal in the first book, Sonea accidentally discovering Acheron's dark secret. Um, she watched him perform black magic without knowing what it was. And in the end of book one, it was revealed to her <laughs> that this is black magic. And also Rothan knows and Lawlin, the administrator, also knows. But every to everyone else, it's a secret. Akron is the High Lord. He's the head of the guild. Very powerful man. Ordinary magicians knew nothing about black magic, except that it was forbidden. The higher magicians knew only enough to recognize it. Even knowing how to perform black magic was a crime. From Sonea's communication with Lorlin, Rothen now knew that black magic enabled a magician to strengthen himself by drawing power from other people. If all power was taken, the victim died. That's all we know by now. We also learned that Daniel, who had always had a thing for gossip, has gotten the post as an ambassador to one of the neighboring countries, Lean. Um, so he's leaving to Aline soon. I don't know if I mentioned Daniel that much uh, in the last video. He's a good friend of Rothen. He used to be his teacher. Rothen used to be his teacher and his guardian too. Um, so he's a bit older than Sunea, but younger than Rothen. And Rothen still feels somewhat responsible for him. Because Daniel didn't have it very easy either when he was in school. That was due to some rumors about an inappropriately close friendship to another boy. Yeah, so this society is definitely homophobic. We will see some more about that, so just so you know in advance. Yeah, so Daniel has a sea journey ahead of him and Sunea is starting her first classes. And I like that we really get to see some of the classes and also read parts of her school books, um, see her practice. I also really like that in part one, book one, that um, the magic isn't just some something abstract. We actually get some glimpses into what magic means in this world. How does it work? What do they have to do in their minds to perform magic? We also meet the Draco Malfoy of the story. His name is Regin. Arrogant, classist, rich guy. While most of the others are just ignoring Sunea, he is actively mean. He's just a mean, pathetic little bully. Actually, nothing more to say about him. But he's also very popular. Um, he's from a very influential family. And he soon forms a friend group around him. 
that friend group consists of pretty much everyone from their class except Zanea. So she doesn't really have the greatest of starts into her new school. Meanwhile, Lolan is still really struggling with what he knows about Akron. Remember, Lolan is the guild's as an administrator and he has always been a close friend of Akron. They've been to school together and have always been friends and Lolan had decided to keep his new knowledge a secret, mainly out of fear, not to protect him. Akron is already known to be the strongest magician by far, probably already due to black magic. It is mentioned that his strength had already been high when he was a novice, um, but normal high. And it had increased a lot after his five years of traveling through the Allied lands. So actually no one knows where his limits might lie. If it should come to a fight, he could just use anyone with magic basically as a power source, because that is what you do with black magic. You take other people's powers. At least that is pretty much all that Lolan knows about it, and he feels like he should know more, which is why he sends Daniel on a secret mission to gather information about whatever it was that Akron did and learned during his journey 10 years ago. And this journey started in Aline, where Daniel is now ambassador. And meanwhile, Lolan has to keep up pretense of a good friend friendship with Akron. And they actually are kind of fun together. Well, as fun as you can be while talking politics and guild business. But yeah, they are friends and you see that through their interactions. Anyway, Daniel has a safe journey to Aline where he arrives to start his new post. He's super prepared. He knows all the names and customs, but still it's kind of odd and exciting for him to be in a different country where the people dress differently, more luxuriously, and everything's just different. And I really liked reading that. Um, I always like traveling stories, even or maybe especially in fantasy countries. Yeah, so Daniel meets his fellow ambassador and the court and the king and also Tyant, who works at the Great Library and he assisted Akron in his research 10 years ago when he was still a little boy. So that is a start on his secret mission. I love secret missions. Yeah, those are all plot lines, um, aspects of the book that I really, really liked. So Nea, meanwhile, is still way ahead of the class. She already knows how to use her magic. Her bigger challenge is staying calm while the other novices play pranks on her and are just stupid and mean, actually. Honestly, it makes me annoyed to talk about it and I don't think it is worth talking about. Unlike a set of strange murders happening in the city that are starting to keep the guard on edge. The victims all have a strange set of cuts on them and that and also the accounts of an eyewitness make Lolan suspect that the killer might be Akron using black magic. Because remember, cutting people is part of the ritual of um, taking someone's power. This is just a very small little murder mystery side plot, which I think is always great. Um, I think it could have taken up more of the story, but it's not the main plot right now. So we only see Lolan getting some information about the murders and gathering that it must have been a black magician, either Akron or someone else. Yeah, he of course thinks it's Akron. I was more interested in this, but this is a story about Sunea. So we get her, we get to see her um, in school which is becoming more and more intolerable and she decides to put in the extra work and try to pass her tests early in order to be moved to a higher class. So she wants to just jump ahead because she wants to get away from Regin and her classmates. So she's just studying a lot. Yeah, of course she's not left alone and because she's still living with Rothen and not with the other novices, they start to spread rumor that something's going on between Rothan and Sunea. Which, of course, is not true, but 
yeah, it put them under a lot of pressure and it's overall not a nice situation. And finally, Sonea does move into the novices' quarters. Yeah, like I said, I found myself a little bit more interested in what Daniel is experiencing in the court of Aline. Um, He finds his way around the court. He's approached by the local gays about the rumors that used to surround him. And he also manages to visit the Great Library. As I said, I really like the storyline, um, just the descriptions of this strange country. Um, I think that's something that Trudy Canavan can do really well and kind of underutilized in this trilogy. I think in this book of the trilogy, it's still, um, we get to see most of it. But yeah, I loved it so much in her other trilogy, The Age of the Five. It's one of the things that made me really enjoy rereading it. Um, yeah, here it's mostly a backdrop for Daniel trying to retrace Akron's steps from 10 years ago, which is also something that I like, so I'm fine with it. And like I said, that retracing, investigating, leads him to the Great Library and to Tyant. They do the research together, and after reading many, many books from the Great Library, they decide to retrace Akron's steps and travel to Lonmar, another neighboring country. They still don't know what they are looking for. They believe they are looking for ancient magic and trying to finish Akron's quest from back then. Yeah, and also solve kind of a mystery because nobody knows what Akron did during his travels. When Akron came back to the guild, I think five years ago, he was all dirty and dressed poorly and he never really talked about the last part of his travels, um, what he experienced. Yeah, so Daniel gets to have another sea voyage, this time accompanied by Tyant. Meanwhile, Sunea passes her tests and is allowed to join the higher class, which shows to be a good thing because no one is aggressive to her and one boy, Poril, he is even nice to her and talks to her. Yeah, she th still thinks Poril is kind of annoying and bad at magic. Okay. Yeah, the others mostly ignore her, so it's not nice, but it's still definitely a step up. So Nea kind of thinks of them as children anyway, so not really friendship material from either side. Until they graduated, they were free from family responsibilities, such as presenting themselves at court marriage and managing whatever income-producing interests in farming or manufacturing their family was involved in. Joining the guild extended their childhood for an extra five years. That's how she thinks of them. Yeah, but Regin is still there. There's been a little break where he left Sonia in peace for a while, but we soon find out that this is because he's been studying. He to pass the test to skip a class and now he's in Sonea's class again. Just won't leave her alone. Yay. So it goes back to school bullying. Regin steals her notes before a test, but Sonea is a smart one and she passes the test without them. In a way, actually being bullied by Regin really furthers Sonea's education. So at least there's that. And she gets a visit from Sari. They have a cute little conversation about how they could manage to murder Regin. But I think that Sari has a point, not in murdering Regin, but in fighting back. Personally, I would like her to steal Regin's notes for a change and see how he manages without them. Sari is more on the I'll hurt his family for you path, but Sunea just keeps her anger to herself. Well, until it's time to focus in her fighting lessons um, and she focuses on her anger, which leads her to magic strike a lot more powerful than anyone else and she destroys the target. But things get unpleasant again as a missing pen from one of the other students is found in Sunea's bag and everyone believes that she stole it. She's the thief girl. And yeah, this time it's not only the students, but also the teachers that think badly of her. But at least Sunea can use a shield now. She kept a strong shield up to protect herself from missiles, shoves or other pranks. 
This meant she could easily push past Regin and his followers if they surrounded her in the corridors. Her room door was protected by a shield of its own, as was her window and her box. She was using magic all day and night, yet she never felt tired or drained. Yeah, as I said, at least it's helping her practice. Cool. Meanwhile, Daniel and Tyand complete their journey to Lonmar after being attacked by weird sea creature leeches. Um, yeah, and they have a bit of a culture shock, discovering the very strict religion and legal system of Lonmar, where, for example, homosexuality is punishable by death. Yeah. So far, Daniel and Tyand have not spoken about their sexual orientation, dating life, whatever, but they are definitely shippable. But yeah, let's hope that they wait until they are out of Lonmar, because that doesn't seem like a good place. Daniel and Tyand visit the splendid temple in Lonmar, and Daniel convinces the priest to let him see the same old scrolls that Akron once read, but they do not contain anything of interest. So they continue their journey to the next country, to Vin. And Lothlin is still trying to stay informed on the murder series in the city, and he finds that the murderer has either changed his way of operating, or it's a different murderer now. In fact, he finds that for the last five or four or five years, this has been happening quite often. So there were weird series of murders, and then they stopped, and they started again, but a little bit differently. Yeah, and when did Akron come back to the city five years ago? For Sonia, it's still lonely school life. Regin injured her only friend Poril, which led to him ending the friendship with Sonia. Like, this is not just petty school bullying. This is dangerous. Um, Yeah, but it turns out that in their fighting lessons, novices are paired according to their strength. So Sonea ends up with Regin, and at first he wins because Sonea has never practiced fighting before, and Regin has been taking extra lessons. He proves that when him and his gang ambush Sonea on her way back from class, um, because they have learned a way to combine their strengths by touching each other, so touching Regin, so he can attack her a lot stronger. But as it turns out, Sonea is still stronger than all of them together. And she's also smart and manages to get away from them by blinding them with a bright light. Is this Mary Sue behavior? I don't know. No, I don't really think so. She's just very, very powerful magically. But that's like the premise of the story. Her powers develop naturally. Um, so that already means that she's very powerful. And other than that... She doesn't have that many Mary Sue qualities, I think. She's a bit annoying, so that would match. Anyway, of course the others snitch on her and try to pose as the victims of an ambush themselves. Then she blinded them, just like that. Yeah, but remember from the last book how the guild deals with accusations, which is also why Isenea never tells any of the teachers about Regin's attacks, by the way. They do a truth reading. So they have someone look into your mind to check your memories so you can't lie. And Sonea, of course, can't risk anyone finding out about Akron using black magic. Remember, that's how Lolan found out last time. He did a truth read on Sonea and he discovered her memory of watching Akron. Yeah, so Sonea doesn't want to risk that again. And Regin, of course, also doesn't want his mind read um, because he's actually the one attacking Sonea all the time. So... Yeah, he tells the teachers about how the attack actually went, this one. Yeah, anyway, this whole situation brought to the teacher's attention that Sonea is stronger than a whole group of other students combined. Also, Rothan gets visited by his son, who we haven't met before. His name is Dorian, and he lives in a small village somewhere, and he works as a healer. As always... Seeing his son smile after a long absence brought an ache of sadness. It was when Dorian was his most charming that he reminded Rothan of his deceased wife. The boy had also inherited Yelara's almost obsessive dedication to healing. He's not a boy any longer, Rothan rem reminded himself. Dorian had turned 24 a few months past. He was a grown man. 
I just wanted to leave that here. Maybe you can already guess where this is going. Anyway, so far Dorian seems nice and charming, always in a good mood, and he gets along well with Rothen. And he is, of course, a healer. And so Nea wants to become a healer. Also, he's really nice to her and tells her that he wasn't very popular either when he started university. So Dorian wants to help Sonea and for her it's great not to be alone in all of this anymore. Have someone to talk to. So after Lonmar was a bit disappointing, Daniel and Tyend have reached Vin. Um, they're in the city that is busy with the festival and Tyend gets robbed and stabbed right before Daniel's eyes, who accidentally kills the murderer because he reacts so strongly. But most importantly, he is there to heal Tyant. And Tyant never wanted to be healed from minor stuff like seasickness because when healing, you can look into people's minds and you also see what else might be wrong with them on a physiological level. Tyant's heart raced. His muscles were stiff with tension. A feeling of relief and dread touched Daniel's mind. He frowned. A lingering fear was to, expect, was to be expected, but there was something different about this feeling of dread. His senses t shifted to the mental level, and suddenly Tyan's thoughts spilled into his mind. Perhaps he won't see. No, it's too late. He's probably seen already. Now he'll, re now he'll reject me. Karelian magicians are like that. They think we're perverted. Unnatural. But no, he'll understand. He says he knows what it's like. But he's not a lad himself. Or is he? He could be hiding it. No, he couldn't be. He's a Karelian magician. Daniel is surprised and his mind goes through the last months and lists all the possible signs like, huh? <laughs> but he doesn't tell Tyan that he knows. But he does think about it a lot. Mainly he's scared that his association with Tyan might start the rumors about himself again. Yeah. Daniel scowled down at his wine glass. Why did it always come to this? Tyant was a good companion, a man he liked and valued. Thinking of ending their friendship for fear of gossip reaching the guild made him feel ashamed and angry. Surely he could enjoy the scholar's company without endangering his reputation. Let the gossips talk, he thought. I'll not let them ruin another promising friendship. But if the guild heard and was outraged enough to order him home... No, they wouldn't do something that dramatic on the strength of a mere rumor. They know what the lean court is like. They won't act unless they hear something really damning. And they won't, Daniel told himself. They do finally talk about it, and we found out, find out that Tyant actually could have become a magician himself. He has magical powers, and there was a time where he quite wanted to. But he couldn't, because he couldn't risk being found out as gay. Um, yeah, he thought that being gay is something physically wrong that a healer would notice um, because that is what he was told to believe and that is so horrible. Yeah, it's good that they finally talked about it and they decide to stay friends. Speaking of friends, Sunea and Dorian spend some more time together. He shows her a half-secret way up to the roof of the university and they enjoy the view together and Dorian talks a bit about what it's like to live in a small village in the mountains close to the border of a different country, Sachaka. That country is mentioned a lot um, because some centuries ago there was a big war between Karelia and the allied countries on one side and Sachaka on the other side. The allied countries won. And I think there's not much contact to Sahaka now, that's as much as we know. So Nea and Dorian follow through with their plan to expose Regin. Did I talk about that? Dorian, like Sari, thinks that Sonea shouldn't stay quiet, she should do something. But instead of retaliating and hurting Regin herself, he thinks that she should expose him for what he truly is and thereby clear Sonea's name. So they managed to get him caught while trying to put another stolen item into Sunea's bag. So that is something. It really helps her. And before Dorian leaves again, he takes Sunea to another secret place in the woods. And it sounds like they are just walking for ages uphill through the snow. <laughs> it's winter. 
Um, but they reach a spring, a natural water source, and a very beautiful place that he discovered when he was a novice. But then, we get this. What are you thinking, little Sunea? I want to thank you. His eyebrows rose. Thank me. For baiting Regin, for taking me up on the roof of the university, she chuckled, for teaching me to levitate. Ah, he waved his hand dismissively. That was easy. And for making me enjoy myself again. I think I almost believed that fun wasn't part of being a magician. She smiled crookedly. I know you have to go back, but I wish you could stay longer. His expression grew serious. I'll miss you too, little Sunea. He took a step closer, then opened his mouth as if to say something else, but no words came. Putting a finger under her chin, he tilted her head up, bent closer, and pressed his lips to her mouth. <sighs> I want to like it. So I want to think that this is cute. But little Sunea, why does it have to be like this? <laughs> I want her to have a love interest. And yeah, Dorian seems likable, but, but why? Remember when Dorian was introduced to us and Rothen was explicitly thinking, oh, he's not a boy anymore, he's a grown man. Sunea is 17 and she's in school and he calls her little Sunea. Just why? I mean, yeah. Yeah, what can I say? He seems nice, but he's also 24 years old. He's a healer, living his life. He's graduated years ago and he's one of the only people that are at all nice to her, showing her secrets, scheming with her. <sighs> yeah, why? He could have just been 18 and freshly graduated and we could have had the same thing, the same story. Why did he have to be years older? I don't know. I'm not really one of those people that say all age gap relationships with the person being 18, 20 and the other one being older have to be inherently bad, predatory. I don't think that. I think that in real life, relationships 18 and 22, something like that, can be fine. Like, it can happen without a weird power dynamic. People can just match. It can happen. Not at 13 and 30, obviously. But I think 18 and 22, that can be okay. In real life... If there isn't a power imbalance. But in this specific situation, her being 17 and him being 24, her being in school, him being a healer, her being in a very vulnerable position where she's just looking for someone to be nice to her, and him just coming there, being a charmer. As I said, he seems nice. Nothing here in the text says that he is a predator or something. He actually is written like a likable love interest. But that's the point. This is written. This is fiction. But what also happens in real life is grooming. And I'm not going to make this a video about grooming. And I'm sure I'm not telling you anything new. But I think it's easy to say, oh, what a creep at a 300-year-old fairy who's preying on a 17-year-old. Like in my last video. I don't know if you saw that. That is easy. A situation like this, it can be nuanced. I don't want to paint everyone who's in a relationship with a person a few years younger as a predator. But yeah, I just think that as an author who's making this whole story up, where you can choose what you portray as romance, you can choose the ages of your love interests, you can just make it all up. And you know that this is a book that is read probably primarily by teenagers. I think you just have to remember your responsibility of not portraying something that can potentially be very dangerous and very unhealthy as romance. I'm not saying that all those relationships have to be bad, but a lot of them are. And I'm just so sick of the love interest always being this older man. Yeah, I'm ranting. I'm going off script here. But it's annoying to me. And yeah, I don't want to pretend to be some moral authority here i'm not there are people on here on youtube talking about grooming a lot more um a lot better than i ever could i just know that i don't like reading things like that anymore and i don't remember how i felt about it when i first read those books 
as a teenager. Probably I thought it was cute. I don't know. I don't remember. Yeah, as I said, there are whole video essays on here um, talking about the dangers of grooming and also the dangers of consuming media that romanticizes and glorifies age gap relationships and doesn't show them as grooming, shows them as romantic. Yeah, I don't know why Trudy Canavan just didn't make him 18. It could have been the same story, just without this. Let's go on. Surprised, Sonea pulled away a little. He was very close, his eyes bright and questioning. Suddenly her face was too warm, and her heart was pounding very fast. She was smiling foolishly, and, though she tried, she couldn't stop. Dorian laughed quietly, then bent to kiss her again. This time his lips lingered, and she was conscious of their softness and warmth. She felt a shiver run down her spine, but she wasn't cold. When he moved away, she swayed forward a little, prolonging the touch. He stepped backward, his smile fading. I'm sorry, that wasn't fair of me. Yeah, Dorian just remembered that he is leaving that same day, and they were actually meant to say goodbye. Um, yeah, Sunea is mostly surprised, in a good way, but she also thinks... Until a moment ago, she hadn't even considered the possibility that he could be more than just a friend. Okay. Age gap aside, Sonia didn't send any signals of wanting to kiss him because she haven't, hadn't even thought about it before. But Sonia liked it, so all is fine, I guess. Good for Dorian. Let's just not make a habit of surprise kissing your underage friends. It's even acknowledged in the text, not the surprise kissing, but the age gap. When Rothen later says to Sunea, Don't worry, I approve. I don't think the age difference will matter. It's only a few years. Okay, but why include it in the first place? Why make a likable figure in your text say that? Is this propaganda for age gap relationships with a minor? I don't know. Am I reading too much into it? I don't know. Let's see what book three will bring. Yeah, maybe some of you think I'm making too big of a deal of this. It is a fantasy setting. I'm just tired of this being the norm in books like this. Um, so often the love interest is older and it's never treated as a big deal. It's treated as romantic and normal. Here it's even addressed, but in a yeah, this is fine kind of way. And it just shouldn't be normal. It shouldn't be normal in the real world. Yeah, as I said, it doesn't have to be unhealthy, but in many, many cases, it is. And you have a power imbalance, and it's dangerous for young people to read this, to experience this, and to think it's okay. I'm aware that this book is from 2002, and a lot of things have changed since then, so I will stop for now, but only for now. Good. More stuff is happening. Sonea is just about to take an important test when she is summoned to Rothen's quarters. She's like, okay, what's going on? Did something happen? And she just rushes over there. The door swung open at her touch. Rothen stood by the window. He turned as she entered the room. She opened her mouth to ask the question hovering on her lips, but caught herself as she saw his warning expression. She felt the presence first. It was tangible, unhidden. It filled the room like a thick, suffocating smoke. Terror sent her heart racing, but she managed to compose her expression to what she hoped was only surprise and respect. You don't know why he's here, she told herself as she turned. Don't let him see that you're frightened of him. Keeping her eyes on the floor, she turned to face the visitor and bowed. Excuse me, High Lord. Akron fixed Rothen with a stare that would have turned her to ice. I am here to find the source of a certain rumor. A rumor I drew from the administrator concerning you and your novice. Rothen nodded. He seemed to choose his next words with great care. I thought that rumor about us had passed. Nobody appeared to give it credence, and the dark eyes flashed. Not that rumor. I am referring to a rumor about my nocturnal activities. A rumor that must be stopped. So Akarin had read Lawland's mind, and he found out that they know about him using black magic. It had to happen someday. And he wants to read their minds too to see whether they told anyone. It's all right, Sonia. Rothen's voice was strained. Stay where you are. 
Closing the distance between himself and her guardian in a few strides, Akron placed his hands against the sides of Rothman's head. He closed his eyes, and his face smoothed into an unexpectedly peaceful expression. Rothman drew in a sharp breath and swayed. The hands at his sides clenched, then opened again. Sunea took a step forward and stopped. She dared not interfere. What if it caused Akron to harm Rothman? Frustrated, frightened, she clenched her fists until she felt her nails bite into her palms. Sonea then is next. She heard Akron's footfall behind her. Her heart raced as she turned to face him. The black robes rustled softly as the High Lord moved forward. She backed away and felt Rothman's hands on her shoulders. Akron frowned as he reached toward her. Cool fingers brushed her face, and she flinched. Then his palms pressed firmly against her temples. A presence touched her mind, but it had no personality. She sensed no thoughts or feelings. Perhaps he didn't have emotions. The thought wasn't comforting. So his mind reading is different from what she's used to. Um, but she tries to fight. She keeps thinking of many, many different things and images. A mental image of a storm appeared. A funnel of images that kept him trapped in its core. She did not know if the picture was real or something her mind had created. Pain. Knives ripping through her skull. A cry reached her ears. Realizing that she had made it, she opened her eyes and her consciousness swayed between the outer and the inner world. Hands tightened on her shoulders. A voice came from above. Stop fighting me, it commanded. So he does find everything he's looking for in her mind. You would both expose me if you could, Akron said. He was silent for a time, then turned to face them. I will claim Sonia's guardianship. Her abilities are advanced and, as Lurland surmised, her strength is unusually high. No one will question my choice. So he's going to be her guardian instead of Rothen. And he threatens them both with hurting the other to keep them both silent. Sonea stared at him in horror. She was to be his hostage. Come along, Akarin said. The novice's room in my residence hasn't seen an occupant in many years, but it has always been kept ready for one. You will find it much more comfortable than those in the novice's quarter. Part 2 starts one day later <laughs> so yeah this is all still new um but sonea now lives with akarin and also his servant takan yeah this is of course a big deal um for the entire guild everyone's talking about it and it isolates sonea but she was already isolated before so now most people are scared and leave her in peace so that's something but she is super on edge the whole time. She tries to hide from Akron. Um, yeah, he seems to leave her be. But she really feels scared. And she also feels a huge responsibility in her situation. There could never be anyone else. Not while she was Akron's hostage. To make a friend was to bring someone else into danger. Um, yeah, she's thinking of this about Dorian. So she further isolates herself. Out of fear. Next, it's winter break, so most novices leave the university, but Sonea, of course, can't. <laughs> um, the library closes, where she spent most of her free time until now. So Sonea needs something else to do. She doesn't want to be in Akron's residence any longer than she needs to. So she decides to discover more of the not so well known passageways of the university. Yeah, and there are a lot. So she makes a map um, because they are very confusing and this is how she spends her winter break. Also, Lolan is kind of shaken about Akron finding out, but he knows that there is nothing he can do. And also, Akron gave him a ring that he needs to wear, um, a ring made from his own blood, which allows Akron to see and hear everything that Lolan sees and hears. Also, through the ring, they can communicate in their minds without anyone being able to listen. Because usual mind speak, magicians can speak in their minds, but anyone can just listen in. So yeah, so with this, um, Akron sometimes just talks into Lolan's head to comment on what he's doing and listens to his thoughts. Nice. But they also meet in person. Why have you done this, Akron? Why black magic? Akron met his gaze levelly. Of all people, Lawlin, you are the one I wish I could tell. I saw it change how you regard me. If you had thought defeating me was possible, you would have sent the guild against me. Why didn't you ask what I was doing when you first learned of it? Because I didn't know what you would do. 
After all the years we were friends, you didn't trust me. After what I saw in Tunea's mind, I realized I didn't know you at all. Akron's brows wrote, That's understandable. It's a powerful thing, this belief that black magic is evil. Is it? Akron frowned, his eyes focusing far beyond the floor. Yes. Then why practice it? Lolan demanded. He held up the hand bearing the ring. Why this? I cannot tell you. Be assured, I'm not intending to take over the guild. You don't have to. You're already High Lord. The corners of Akron's mouth curled up. I am, aren't I? Then be assured, I'm not about to destroy the guild, or anything else you hold dear. Putting down his glass, he rose and moved to the serving table. Filling another glass, he handed it to Lolan. I will tell you one day, Lolan. I promise you that. I kind of like this dynamic. I think there could have been more of this. Um, I kind of want them to be friends again. This would also have been an interesting premise for a book, to focus more on their dy dynamic instead of Sunea as an outsider. They have had such a strong friendship. Yeah, this is interesting, but it's also just a side plot. There are so many side plots in this book. I don't think... <laughs> I'm really interested to hear if you can follow anything I am talking about or if you're just super confused by now. Let me know. Also, didn't I say I want to keep this one shorter and not retell the whole plot? Yeah. I might have to work on that. Anyway, Daniel and Tyant are visiting the next potential place of secret knowledge, the Tombs of White Tears, which are literal tombs um, deep in a cave in a mountain. Yeah, I still like this treasure hunt thing they are doing, even though they don't know what exactly they are looking for. And they do find a tomb of an old magician, um, and it says that she was a powerful magician and she practiced high magic, which they don't know what to make of, but they are getting somewhere. And it's also interesting because there is this old tomb. Um, also at the guild, there is an old cemetery for magicians, but today magicians never leave a corpse when they die because their leftover magic just explodes. This is a mystery already. And after that, Daniel and Tyant go back to Kapia and they make plans on how they could continue working together. If anyone says anything about me, you should be outraged that they would slander my name. I'll plead with my friends that they keep you in the dark, because it's important to my work. If we're convincing enough, we'll be able to continue working together without anyone questioning. Very well. I'll act like the arrogant Karelian magician people expect. He looked at Tyant. But I want you to remember, if I say anything harsh or judgmental, I don't really mean it. Cute. Also, when Daniel gets back, he has a letter waiting from Lolan, telling him that his research is no longer needed. And another letter from Rothen asking Daniel to do that same research. <laughs> cool, that was a bit funny. If he set aside all speculation, only three certainties remained. Firstly, Lolan had wanted to know what Akron had learned on his journey, and now didn't. Secondly, Rothen now wanted the same information that Akron had sought. Thirdly, both Lolan and Rothen wanted, wanted the search to remain a secret, and Akron had never made his own discoveries public. There was a mystery here. Also, Daniel and Tyand meet again at a party, and Tyand is all, what would you say if there was someone I'm interested in? And Daniel is all like, huh, maybe he's interested in his friend over there. <laughs> He's so clueless. <laughs> anyway, Akron left Sonea alone for now, but that changes when suddenly he calls her out of class to have a meal with her, really caring for her education. But they do talk about her education mainly. Um, it's all a little weird, but the food apparently is great. Meals like this might be worth suffering his company for, she thought. I want you to dine here with me every first day night. Sonea froze. Had he read her mind? Or was this what he had intended all along? Also, Sonea now volunteers working in the library because um, she just has to be somewhere in her free time. Because Rajin found out that she won't call for Akron for help. So he and his gang turned to physically, magically attacking her again. 
Like literally, she cannot go through the corridors in peace without fear of being attacked. It's really, it's intense. I'm skipping over this a little bit, but yeah. And from the librarian, she hears about a map of the underground tunnels underneath the university and through the university. And she thinks, okay, this is my chance to move around unseen by the other novices and have my peace. Um, so when she's working at the library one night, she finds a way to break into the cabinet where the oldest books are stored. And she does find a map of secret passageways, not the confusing unused corridors that she already discovered, but real hidden passages inside the walls, hidden behind paintings. Um, tunnels underneath the university grounds. It's great. Um, yeah, so she super quickly makes a copy of the map and now she has something new to do with her free time. And also she finally makes progress in her private fighting lessons that she has to take. Daniel and Tyant discover that after visiting the places that they already went to, Akron most likely traveled through the mountains into Sahaka. You know, the country that was defeated in the war some time ago. And it's bordered to Karelia and Elin are mountains and then wastelands from the war. But before they can go there, they have some other visits to do because Daniel is still actually working as an ambassador. And on the way there, they stop to visit Tyan's sister, Mary. And she takes Daniel for a walk and just goes, listen, I'm his big sister. I don't want him to be hurt. I think Tyant has a crush on you. Daniel blinked in surprise. Me? I'm Tyant's secret love interest? He looked at the empty chair. No wonder Tyant had been so evasive. He felt strangely pleased. It's flattering to be admired by someone, he told himself. First of all, come on. And second, his secret love interest? <laughs> Is that something that people actually used to say? Anyway, Mary is kind of scary. She's all like, don't hurt my little brother. Okay, good night. <laughs> Daniel is, wait, it says, he was surprised, but not dismayed. It even pleased him a little to know someone liked him that much. Or do I like the idea for other reasons? Closing his eyes, he pushed that thought away. He had faced those questions before, and their consequences. Tyant was, and could only ever, be a friend. Mm -hmm. We'll see about that. Anyway, we also have news from the serial killer. Um, Lolan gets informed that the killer has been seen using magic, but he can't tell anyone. And while he's thinking about what to do, Akron speaks in his mind and tells him that he should investigate the murders himself and to keep this detail, the magic, a secret to prevent a panic. I would be so annoyed if someone kept talking into my thoughts, but they also could have used it so much more. Lolan sighed. He looked down at the ring on his hand. Are you the murderer? He projected at it. There was no answer. So Nea is still discovering the secret passageways and one day she forgets her map and gets lost. And she accidentally discovers that one of the passages leads into the High Lord's residence, directly into the underground room where she once witnessed um, the black magic where it all started. But that is nothing against what happens when she is cornered by the novices the next time and runs as fast as she can to the next entrance to the secret passages. She yanked the lever down and stumbled through the opening, then pushed the door closed. Surrounded by darkness, she peered through the peephole, breathing heavily. Through the little hole, she saw several novices pass. Counting them, she felt ill. Twenty novices. But she had evaded them. Her heartbeat slowed and her breathing quieted. A little warm air touched her neck. Sonea frowned. Warm air? Then, beneath the sound of her own breathing, she heard another, softer breath. She spun around and willed a light into existence, then choked down a cry of terror. Dark eyes bore into hers. His arms were folded across his chest, the inkle glinting gold against the black of his robes. His face was set in a disapproving scowl. Swallowing hard, she edged sideways, but an arm rose to block her path. Get out, he snarled. <laughs> I don't know why this is funny. Is it just me, or does he remind you of Snape? 
is this Snape fan fiction? I have questions. <laughs> but now she has to leave the secret way. She doesn't argue, she doesn't explain herself, she just leaves and of course the other novices find her again. Because yeah, she was hiding. Well, we later learn that Akron doesn't help her because he wants her to learn to defend herself. And he's watching her progress. Nice. Sonia is angry and annoyed enough to leave the guild for a few hours and visit her aunt and uncle in the city. This is also where she first learns about the murders and that the murderer is said to be wearing a ring with a red stone. And she also suspects that it has to be Akron. She looked down at the table, then stole a glance at him. Was she sitting opposite a murderer? His eyes slid to hers, and she quickly averted her gaze. Ranel had said that the murderer wore a ring with a red gemstone. Looking at Akron's hands, she was almost disappointed to see they were bare. Not even a mark to hint that the ring might have been worn regularly. His fingers were long and elegant, yet masculine. Sorry, what? Sonia? What's going on? Oh, also in the next old ruins they visit, um, Tyant and Daniel find Akron's name written on a wall, just like, Akron was here. <laughs> no, we later find out that he actually wrote a warning on the wall and signed it with his name. Yeah, but I still kind of like the thought that he was just leaving his name, maybe with a date. Anyway, that is how they know they are on the right track. Well, kind of. Daniel walks right into an ancient execution room thing and he uses up all his magic trying to escape. He's just empty of magic and in the end Tyant saves him and carries him out while Daniel is unconscious. And when he wakes up, his magic powers are still completely empty and I'm alive, he thought. He looked around at the trees, the sky than Tyant. He really is a beautiful man, he thought suddenly, remembering how he had been struck by the scholar's fine look that first day at Capia's docks. He felt something at the edge of his thoughts, like a memory just out of reach. It grew stronger as he concentrated on it, and he felt a famili familiar uneasy feeling steal over him. He tried to push it away. Suddenly he was acutely aware of his lack of magical strength. He frowned, wondering why he had reached for his powers unconsciously. Then realization came. He had been about to use his healing powers to take away the uneasiness, or at least the physical reaction that had caused it, as I always do, without realizing it. So he has always used his magic to stop feeling any physical response to being attracted to someone, so he can keep ignoring it. So much that he didn't even do it consciously anymore, and actually forgot that he is gay, or managed to push it away so far that he didn't even had to um, acknowledge it anymore. That is really... But I really like this next part. But nothing had changed. The moment he lost the ability to heal, there it was again. He had failed. Daniel? Looking at Tyant, Daniel felt his heart skip. How could he look at his friend and consider that being like him was a failure? He couldn't. So he tells Tyant, and Tyand is just, I know. <laughs> it was more like a guess. If I was right, though, I knew there was a chance you'd never confront it. Now that I know the effort you went to, it's amazing that you have at all. He paused. Habits are hard to break. But I will. Daniel stilled as he realized what he had said. Can I really commit to that? Can I accept what I am and face this fear of discovery and rejection? Looking at Tyand, he heard a voice deep within answer, yes. Yay! They are really cute. But the next thing that happens is that Akron somehow found out that Daniel continued the research and he just orders him home. So he has to return to the guild, just like that. Someone else also comes to visit the guild. Dorian is back. Sonea actually wants to break up with him or tell him she's not interested to continue dating him um, because she doesn't want to endanger him. But first, they talk about the whole Regin situation. And Dorian has the idea that Sonia should challenge him to a duel, or a formal battle, as it's called, in the fighting arena. Why not? Sonia is not really completely convinced, but one day Regin angers enough for her to go through with this plan. 
and she publicly challenges him to a battle. She kind of instantly regrets it, and her fighting teacher also doesn't think she's ready, but a challenge is a challenge. This is very much a duel. So yeah, she gets to training, and in the meantime, Daniel arrives, and yeah, the talk between him and Akron is kind of pointless. He doesn't ask any suspicious questions, he doesn't mention Tyant, um, as Daniel has feared, and he doesn't tell him to stop his research. Why is Daniel here? Maybe so he can watch the battle. So the battle is a big thing. Everyone's watching. It's also the first ever battle in over 50 years. So that doesn't usually happen, especially not between novices. And also she's now very publicly presenting as Akron's favorite novice. They walk in together. He's the one that gives her an inner shield for protection. And um, so they are both protected by their guardians with an extra shield so they don't actually kill each other and this isn't a fight to the death yeah if their own shields fail because their magic isn't strong enough they are still protected the magic very much works like in a video game or something attacking needs power and defending yourself needs even more power and you are trying to wear each other out um but you're not supposed to just use blunt force and keep on going all the time you also are supposed to use tactic and trick each other yeah they have to win the majority of five fights this is a whole thing um this is the grand finale of this book so it's very stretched out very dramatic i feel like i haven't focused enough on the bullying and the constant attacks and the way that sonea has been living in fear not being able to move around the university in any piece she's always on edge she's always getting attacked yeah but i didn't want to repeat that all the time but yeah so this is the finale of this book if you want to read it for yourself do that yeah it's stretched out by tactical fighting but in the end sonea wins and she doesn't only show her tactical skills she shows everyone just how strong she really is You'll have to start teaching her yourself soon, Vinara added. Akron shook his head. All she needs, she can learn in the university. There is nothing else that I can teach her that she would care to learn, for now. Okay. Four weeks had passed since the challenge, and not once had she encountered Regin and his allies in the university passages after class. No sniggers had re reached her ears in the corridors, and not one of her projects had been ruined. Um, the first people even started talking to her like normal people. So this really was a good idea. But one day she comes home, she's kind of happy, but once she enters the building, she hears noises and notices that something magical is going on. She should leave, get as far away as possible. But curiosity kept her still. I want to know what is going on, she thought. And if someone has come to confront Akarin, they might need my help. So she goes down to the cellar and looks through the door. Akron stood over a man dressed in simple clothing. His hand was wrapped around the man's throat, and blood trickled through his fingers. In his other hand was a jeweled knife, a knife that was horribly familiar. As she watched, the stranger's eyes glazed over, and he slumped through the floor. Then Tarkan cleared his throat, and Akron's head snapped up. Their gaze locked, like in her nightmares, in which she relived the night when she had witnessed him, him in this room. Only he saw her watching, and she couldn't move, then woke up with her heart racing. But this time, she wouldn't wake up. This was real. Sonea, he spoke her name, with unconcealed annoyance. Come here. Akarin tells her that this man was an assassin from Sahaka, that he was sent to kill him, and the whole room is trashed, so she kind of believes him. So you killed him, with, with, with what the guild calls black magic. Yes. He took a step toward her, then another, his eyes level and unwavering. I have never killed anyone who did not mean me harm, Sonea. She looked away. Was that supposed to reassure her, when he knew she would expose his secret if she could? That would certainly do him harm. He would be satisfied, indeed, if he knew the harm he has done by coming here and causing you to see what you have seen, Akron said softly. You must be wondering who these people are who want me dead, and what their reasons are. I can tell you only this. The Sakakans still hate the guild, and they also fear us. From time to time they send one of these, to test me. Do you really think it unreasonable of me to defend myself? That she does not really believe. But 
It does not matter if you believe me or not, Sonea. He narrowed his eyes at the door, which swung open with a faint creak. Only remember that, if you speak a word of this, you will bring about the destruction of everything you hold dear. As she reached the door to the guest room, a voice drifted up from the room below. At least the murders will stop. For now, Akron replied, until the next one comes. The end. <sighs> okay, wow. What should I say? Mm, yeah, my notes say I want to read on now. Uh, so yeah, I still liked it. Like I said, um, it took me a while to get into it. But especially in the last part, I really wanted to keep on reading. Um, I liked the different storylines. I don't think they were too many, but I think some of them could have been more present. But yeah, this book is already really long. You have to stop somewhere. Um, I didn't really remember all of the traveling and treasure knowledge hunt research um, of Daniel, which is interesting because this time reading, I really liked that. Um, not only because, like I said, I just like traveling in books, but also because here we start to get a little bit more information about this world and the different countries. Again, I think this could have been more. To me personally, it still, it still doesn't really feel like this is a world, fantasy world that I know now. Like I don't know how to explain it. Um, it's like I know the concepts behind the countries and the slum and the guilds, but they don't really feel like one world. Mm, this doesn't feel like a world where I could imagine myself living in and and can imagine my own stories set in this world, which would feel natural. Yeah, also the university and most of the teachers and the other students very much feel like background characters. Um, I don't really feel like I know most of these people either. But yeah, this is not the focus of this book. Actually, what is the focus of this book? <laughs> Maybe that's why it was kind of a bit slow in the beginning, because this isn't really a story with the beginning and a middle and a conclusion. Like we had a bit of a conclusion with the Regin bullying storyline with the fight in the end, mm, but not to the overall story. Yeah, I don't know. Don't get me wrong. I don't think this is bad. Um, I personally kind of liked it. Like I like stories that kind of just flow. As long as there's enough going on, which there definitely is. But I think that this is something that might be a little bit irritating if you're really used to reading books with that strict structure. But yeah, personally, I like it if there's many things going on at the same time, just in the lives of those people um, that are, of course, connected to each other and progress the main plot. Yeah. Mm, what else? As I said, I was sometimes a bit annoyed with the school bullying stuff, um, but I think I might have probably liked it when I first read the books, when I was in school myself. Um, so I could relate a lot more to those other popular kids. Um, school is unfair, all that stuff. Yeah, maybe it was more Sunia that annoyed me with being so passive, but then she's super scared all the time, so... Yeah, regarding that, nothing has changed during the entire book. Like, her overall situation is the same. She's still scared of Akron. He knows now that has changed, and she has to live with him, and she noticed his manly hands. Yeah, maybe looking back now, this kind of feels a little bit like filler. Um, Not that I would have wanted it to be more dramatic. I liked the book, I liked the vibe with the university... I think it was very necessary to get a feeling of the world, to get a lot more information. Um, yeah, I liked all this secret passages, library, dark secrets. Like I said, it was kind of fantasy dark academia in a way. Um, we just didn't learn many new things. Not about black magic, not about Akron. They didn't form an alliance to stop him or whatever. Um, they were not really active all of the characters. It was mostly just time for Sonea to learn and to train and to endure this situation. But somehow I'm talking about it for ages, so it's not like nothing happened in this book. <laughs> yeah, I was trying to transport that vibe. I don't know if I managed that, but yeah, I think this is a skill to make something like that a good read without 
there being action every two pages or a focus on romance. Um, but yeah, I remember that a lot more plot is going to happen in the last book, book three, and this was all very much leading up to it. So I feel like book one was a story in itself and then book two leads up to the events of book three where all the action happens and quite a bit of the romance. So you know what to do if you don't want to miss my video on book three. It might take a while, you know. And yeah, I think I'll leave it at that. Um, before I start repeating myself even more, let me know your thoughts in the comments. I'm always super curious what you think about these books and these stories. Go and read book three if you feel like it and meet me again for the next video. Have a nice rest of your day. Bye!